starting to say Tyrone has traveled a long distance to be here. As many of you know, Tyrone is on the road constantly. I sat down on the bus next to somebody yesterday during our field trip, and this was a professor from Green Mountain College, and he said, oh yeah, Tyrone spent a week with our students at our, at our school. <laughs> so Tyrone is dedicated to sharing information like many of the other academicians here at the conference. Um, he is a professor of integrated biology uh, and has worked tirelessly on the chemical atrazine and its impacts on the endocrine system, uh, demasculinization and feminization of amphibians, and has taken those concepts, tr applied them to the regulatory process, suffered um, you know, from the abuse of the chemical industry on attempts to defame character and, and do other nasty things that we heard Kerry Gillum talk about last night. So speaking truth to power isn't, doesn't come as easy as saying it. Uh, doing it does not come as easy as saying it. And Tyrone's uh, the example of that. Uh, Tyrone got his undergraduate degree at Harvard University and then uh, came to UC Berkeley and where he completed his PhD. So, you know, what can I say about you? I love you and I appreciate all you do, so come on up. Well, first off, before I start, maybe another round of applause for the last speakers. <laughs> because I am honored and humbled to walk on a stage after, after those young people. I'm also here, as I'll explain, ki kind of by accident. And, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. I also want to apologize. I wasn't here yesterday. I just got here today for reasons that I'll explain. Um, and I was supposed to be in a different session for an hour-long talk. I've, I've squashed that now into my 30-minute slot. OK, 35, 36, maybe. I'll go as fast as I can. And, and I'm going to give a, 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 a sort of 30-minute version of the work that allows me to talk about the research that I've been doing, that allows me to talk a little bit about the public health implications and, and my collaborations there, and to talk about some of the new research. Oh, I think I have, a, I have this one on. I think that one's off. Can, can people hear me or no? OK, good, good, good. So here's the version I'm going to give. I don't watch TV. In fact, I haven't had a TV for 30 years. So apparently this is a popular television show. And I'm obviously not going to talk about Tyra, but about this model. The title of this version is America's Next Top Model. What do we really know about her? And I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so explaining that. But before I do, I never present my work or myself without presenting the people who made me who I am. I, I always start with this Bantu proverb, which I won't try to pronounce in Southern Africa. But loosely translated, it means people are people through other people. So I always thank the people who, who got me here. First and foremost, my family. This is an old photograph. So everybody there is important, but especially my mom and my dad, who supported me for these last 50 years. My wife, Catherine Kim, who's put up with me for the last 30 years. And, and also, without her, these two wouldn't be possible. My son, Tyler, my daughter, Casina. <clears throat> and I always show this photograph. It's an old, they're prom pictures. Because I'm equally proud that my son borrowed my tie for his prom and that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. We're that, we're that kind of family. <laughs> and I also, I got to give a shout out. I'm here with a heavy, heavy, heavy heart. My daughter's a competitive gymnast. She's a senior in college now. Yesterday was her last, or this two days, it's her last competition. She made it to the finals. And, and I'm missing that to be here with you. I, and in fact, I came this close to missing my flight this morning, <laughs> just so I could be there to see her do this one more time. But I understand she's, she's done very well. So to my daughter, give my daughter a hand. She's not even here, but. It was a hard, it was a hard decision to make. I also want to thank my, the, the, the people who funded my work. And this is also my disclosure. Here's also why I'm here by accident. I never heard or thought about pesticides, especially atrazine, until the chemical manufacturers asked me, I study frog hormones, asked me to study their chemical. And there's somebody somewhere once said, if you're not pissing somebody off, maybe you're not doing anything important. 
if that's true, I'm pretty important. Because <laughs> they really, Novartis and Genta, they really don't like me. I, and, and that's also as my other disclosure, I have been funded by people like Beyond Pesticides and the Ceres Foundation, but I can assure you that they weren't paying me the way that the chemical manufacturers were. They weren't paying me $1,000 a day to think about atrazine or offering me up to a million dollars to study atrazine, but not to talk about it. That's another story in and of itself. I got to thank the students that were involved and everybody blues an undergraduate. And then I'm flipping through a couple of other lists. The people in green are postdocs. The people in red are, 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 are postgraduate researchers. And, and this is a photo, a fairly recent photo of my lab group. <clears throat> I've had the honor and pleasure of working with an incredible diversity of individuals and a number, I have no personal contact with the agricultural industry, but a number of my students are like the people you've heard from here today who've worked in agriculture. And many of them say to me, wow, we're now studying the chemicals that me and my family got sprayed with when I was growing up. And that's given me a really different perspective on, on the kind of work that we're doing, on frogs and on people. And finally, I dedicate everything that I do to my grandmother, my third parent, who, who really taught me and passed on to me the desire to make the world a better place through education and to do something significant with the three letters that are now behind my name. So, to my grandmother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you mostly about atrazine. This is, this is why I say I'm here, I'm here by accident, because I study frog hormones, and then this chemical company asked me to study atrazine. And in fact, I'm not a chemist. I always have to show the structure, though. In fact, chemistry, you just heard I went to Harvard. Chemistry almost bought me my ticket back home to South Carolina, where I grew up. It, it was so nice, I had to take it twice. But I, I got through it. I got through it. And at Harvard, you know, they don't give Fs. They give A, B, C, D, E. I spent a whole semester trying to convince my parents that E stood for excellent. And <laughs> finally, they bought it. At any rate, this compound is an herbicide. It's a weed killer. It's been used since 1958. We use 80 million pounds a year. It's the number one selling agrochemical, or number two now, selling agrochemical in the country. It's used in more than 80 countries in addition to the US. But it's outlawed in all of Europe. And I always make the point that, that this slide is a lie. At least that's what the company's lawyer says. They say, it has not been outlawed, it has been denied regulatory approval <laughs> by the European Union. I, I, I don't know the difference, but I know that this phrasing pisses them off. So, so this is the, the, the slide that I use. That, that's, just, that's just the kind of brother I am. The point is, the company is based in Europe, and we use 80 million pounds of a chemical that's not allowed in, in all of Europe. So here's our model. Here's America's top model, Xenopus lavus, the African clawed frog, and the company what do we know about her? The company asked me to use this guy because it is the model amphibian. You guys know that term? It's the model amphibian in, in academia, in scientific research. And for some interesting reasons. It's not even a good frog. It can't jump. It doesn't have a tongue. It has a molecular sex determining system that no other frog has, including others in, in, in the genus. The reason that people use it in biology, in laboratories, it's because for some reason, the human pregnancy hormone, if you inject it into this frog, makes it lay eggs. That, that's why everybody uses it, because it's easy to breed. No other frog that I know of, species, responds that way. And, and a lot of curious things come up when, you, when, when, when you're given that fact, right? Like, makes you think something interesting about science. Like, who's the first guy who thought, hey, I, I wonder what'll happen if I inject pee into a frog. I have no idea, I have no idea why anybody ever did that, why anybody would ever try that, but that's, that's why this animal is now our model. Um, but the value of it is that it shows you how similar our hormones as humans are to frog hormones. They interact with each other. So when we find a problem, as I'll get to today, when we find a problem in, in an amphibian's hormones, then if you don't care about frogs, you should also be thinking about what it might do to us. And, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. So this frog is from, well, it's typically from South Africa, but it's, it lives all over Southern Africa. And you can purchase them at, you know, there's stores, there are companies that raise frogs, and you can buy them. I'm a little cheap, though. I learned to be frugal. And in fact, I think Emily might have taken this photograph. I'm a little frugal. There's my son when he was a little one, way before prom, former graduate student, Roger. Emily Chen Marquez, who you heard from, was an undergraduate at this time. You can collect these frogs in San Diego for real cheap. 
So after they figured out other pregnancy tests, people threw these frogs out, and they're actually now resident in San Francisco and San Diego. And, and, and this is going to become important at the end of my talk. This is where my stock came from in my laboratory. I went out and had a vacation with my son, and I collected some frogs from San Diego, some African clawed frogs, or I guess technically African-American clawed frogs in this case. <laughs> anyway, so we got asked by the company. They were paying. At this point, I think they paid me about $150,000, and we exposed some of these frogs to atrazine, and we found out that it inhibited the growth of the voice box, or the larynx, and these frogs. And, and, and that was not, not too good for the company to hear. I was naive. I thought, boy, they're going to be happy at what I found out. That, that wasn't the case. Because male frogs sing and female frogs don't, for the same reason that, in general, men have deeper voices than women, testosterone. So if you're the largest chemical company in the world, as they were at the time, and you hear some information like this about your number one selling product, well, you're not too happy. What's more is, if you're not making enough testosterone, and I should apologize, I know you guys have just eaten, you're going to see a lot of frog gonads today. <laughs> For no, if nothing else, I can promise you, you will probably see more frog gonads today than you ever will in your entire life. <laughs> that, that's, that's the best I can give you. These are not typical frog gonads, though. Because these are testes, like, like any, any male should have. But then this particular frog also has ovaries. It has another testis. It has more ovaries. That's not normal. And that's, that's not a judgment call. This is just kind of to make sure, if you saw Jurassic Park, that you understand that frogs are not naturally hermaphroditic. This is a frog that had been exposed to atrazine. There are not normally testes and ovaries in, in a single frog. So, and eventually, and that was the work that we did with Novartis, who became Syngenta. They became unhappy. And then we got other funding from, from National Science Foundation, as well as for some organizations, to follow up. And we showed things like this. These are two frogs doing the tango, or whatever the dance may be in your, in your culture, except that we now know that there are two males. So we can do genetic testing. So, so there's a gene for example, that only females have. So we can tell with these two individuals, this guy who, who looks like he's smiling <laughs> is a male, and, and that's his brother. So we found out that a significant portion of these atrazine-exposed animals start out as hermaphrodites, and some eventually grow up to completely become females. So for example, even though this is a genetic male, as I just showed you, she can lay eggs. She's completely functional as a female, even though genetically she's male. And this is work that happened after the company decided that they didn't really want to hang out with me anymore, <laughs> which was fine. It worked out just fine. The other thing we showed is that even if you don't turn into a female, if you're a genetic male, if you're exposed to atrazine, your fertility is really low. So we did studies where we paired up control of unexposed males, and they can fertilize about 85% of a female's eggs, but the atrazine-treated males only fertilize about 15%. So they have a very, very low fertility. And the reason they have a low fertility is, and this is more gonads, this is, they're now just, somebody was going to take a picture. I'm going to go back so you can take a picture. So I, I'll, I'll just do that. You know why? Because I'm flexible like that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. Are we good? <laughs> Photo bomb, my own slide. So here's, here's why. One of the reasons that they have such low fertility is they don't even try. So, so, you know, like when you go to the club and the guy has, a, you know, he throws a line, they don't even try. They don't sing. They don't show any reproductive behavior. But even if they did, if you look at their testes under the microscope, and, and I'll walk you through this because probably most of you have not looked at frog testes under the microscope. But if I blow this up, these are testicular tubules, just like we have, guys, full of sperm. And if you look at the atrazine-treated ones, though, this is a testicular tubule, so I've blown that up. There's no sperm, just cellular debris. So they don't have enough testosterone to show male reproductive behavior. And even if they did, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm production. Again, not what you want to hear if this is your number one selling product. So we formulated this hypothesis, because that's what we do as a scientist. We test hypotheses. And our hypothesis was that, it, well, first off, if you're a male, so imagine that's a testis, that, big, that structure there. You shouldn't make testosterone. Do you guys know what the word testosterone means? Do you know, do you know the word portmanteau? Portmanteau. I didn't learn that word until I was 49 years old, and I did pretty good on my SAT. Portmanteau is like when you stick two words together, 
like smoke and fog, you get smog, twist and jerk, you get torque. T testosterone is a portmanteau. <laughs> Somebody got that. Testosterone is a portmanteau. This is where it literally means testicular hormone. So it's the male hormone, and that's its structure. See, I overcame that chemistry problem. So it turns out that you can convert testosterone into estrogen if you're a female, or if you're a male exposed to atrazine, because atrazine induces an enzyme. It induces a machinery, if you will, that converts testosterone into estrogen. Estrogen literally means generator of estrus, another portmanteau. So it's the female hormone, but if you do this as a male, you, lose up your, you use up your testosterone, and you subsequently make estrogen, which tends to feminize you, as I, as I showed you earlier. So, enough about frogs. What this eventually started me to think about is humans, or beyond frogs, because this is a slide from a place called Lake Nabugabu. I think Emily was there with me, actually. And, and I show this slide because there's a crop there, which I believe is arrowroot, and a runoff from that crop goes into this pond, which is where Emily and I were waiting around collecting frogs, and the water from there goes into these containers, and that's the, the cooking and bathing and, and, and drinking water for a nearby village. And so I started to think about if frogs are exposed to chemicals in this water, and fish, we now know fish as well, what about animals that don't live in the water but just come to drink it, and now what about people that are drinking that water, that are taking that water home to, to drink it? And so that's how we're gonna get to people. Eventually, because the company made some claims that there was nothing wrong with atrazine, it was just some crazy guy at Berkeley and frogs, which I'm not gonna deny the crazy guy at Berkeley part, but I was pretty convinced that my work was on the money, so to speak. So I, 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 what I did was I emailed everybody in the world who worked on atrazine and said, hey, let's all write a paper together. And, 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 and so we did that. And we did that because here's a quote from a, a, a scientist, Glenn Fox, who says, in echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. And so we had data from lots of species and lots of different populations, but we wanted to expand that to other groups of animals. And so, but I don't work on other groups of animals. I, I only work on frogs. And so people had done work though on fish, birds, and reptiles, and mammals, including humans. And so for all of those people, okay, some of them didn't want to publish with me, but 22 of them from 12 different countries said, yeah, let's compare our data. And so we published this paper where we showed, again, here's my frogs with sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. Then there's a guy in Belgium who had done the same thing on fish. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. Then there was a couple in Argentina who had worked with caiman. That's like an alligator, it's a reptile. And again, sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, there's no sperm. This is work that was done in Croatia and in Nigeria. I didn't know any of these people. Now I'm going to Croatia, Nigeria, and Argentina. I'm meeting people all over the place. But that's sperm in the testis of a rat. In a, in, a, in a testicular tubule, give it atrazine, no sperm. And then if you, this guy in Pakistan showed in birds, sperm in a testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. So when you have more than 22 people in 12 different countries looking at all these diverse animals and getting the same effect independently, I didn't know any of these guys, you start to think, okay, yeah, maybe there's something that, that we should be worried about. What's more is, is the sperm missing because there's no testosterone? Because testosterone induces sperm. If you reduce testosterone, you get no sperm. I showed that in my frogs, but that was also shown uh, uh, that aromatase is induced in my frogs, and you give atrazine, you get estrogen production, and you get this vitiligenesis and oogenesis. Those are just fancy words for making eggs and yolking up eggs. Here's it again in my frogs. These are, we showed that there are are eggs developing in the testis of frogs. So not only are they not making sperm, which I've, I deem that demasculinization, but they're making eggs, which they shouldn't be. Males, in general, sh you know, shouldn't make eggs. That's, that's just kind of how it is. Not judgment, that's just how it is. But here's a guy working for a US Geological Survey who showed the same thing in fish. So those are eggs in the testis of a fish. And then here's a person in turtles in, uh, working in Canada who showed eggs also develop in the testis of turtles that are exposed to atrazine. So they're not only demasculinized, they're also, across vertebrate animals, they're feminized. Okay, the good news is, if you're exposed to atrazine, you're not gonna make eggs in your testis. Mammals don't do that. But aromatase, which is induced by atrazine, promotes breast cancer and prostate cancer in mammals, including humans. That you'd be concerned about. You can't do experiments in humans. It's unethical but we have what are called correlational data. 
For example, my colleague Shauna Swan, these aren't my data now, I'm one of the few scientists who brags about stuff that somebody else did. We're done talking about my work now. Well, we got a few more minutes in the end. But my colleague Shauna Swan in Columbia, Missouri showed that if you look at what she called control men, that's their atrazine levels in their urine. If you look at men who live in Columbia, Missouri, where they use a lot of atrazine, that have significantly more atrazine in their urine, they tend to have a low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant. So by the way, this level, 0.1 parts per billion, that's 0.1 micrograms per liter, that's 100 nanograms per liter, or 100 picograms per mil. That probably means nothing to most people here. Let me tell you how much that is. That's one one thousandth of a grain of salt in about two liters. It, it's like almost nothing. If you have that much, and that's what we use to chemically castrate our frogs and fish. So guys, so men with a low sperm count in Columbia, Missouri, have enough atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate. The company hates that word, by the way, chemically castrate. That's why I use it as much as I can. It's just the kind of brother I am. Chemically cast. In fact, I'm going to say it three more times. Chemically castrate. Chemically, chemically castrate. So these guys have enough atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish. And just by coincidence, they have a low sperm count, just like all these experiments and all these animals that 22 of us in 12 different countries have done independently. What's more now, I'm going to I spend a lot of time on airplanes learning how to make my PowerPoints move. So I act like you appreciate it. If I squash those data down, yeah. in fact, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you one more time. If I squash those data down, the vertical axis is still the same. I've changed it because here's a person who showed in California. Here's the atrazine levels of men who work in the fields in California. Now I'm going to squash it down again, because here are the levels of men who apply atrazine in California. 2,400 parts per billion. So men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times more atrazine in their urine than we know is associated with low sperm count in Columbia, Missouri. Men who apply atrazine in California have 24,000 times more atrazine than we use to chemically castrate frogs or fish. I like to break it down like this. One of these guys could pee in a bucket. I could dilute the atrazine in their urine 24,000 times, and I could use the atrazine in one man's urine, who's working in the field, to chemically castrate 24,000 tanks of 30 tadpoles each. That, just, just to give you some perspective. And at this stage, because remember, I'm just, I like to describe myself as I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. I'm trying to study frog hormones, and now I'm thinking about environmental justice and environmental racism because 90% of those people that we're talking about are like the, the young individuals that, that you heard from earlier today and like the students in my, who work in my laboratory who said, wow, the thing that you're studying is something that we've been exposed to, that my family's been exposed to. And not only that, I always, I always get these questions like, well, can we filter it out of our water? Yeah, you can filter it out of your water. But that doesn't change the problem that's in the environment. It also doesn't change the problem that I just showed you because those high levels in urine don't come from drinking water. Those high urine, levels in that urine of field workers come from being exposed, absorbing it across the skin, and breathing it in. And you just heard from, from one of the individuals here that there's not always protective equipment or instructions about even how to use it or even having it being available. And we're only talking about one chemical that, that's being used here in California and abroad. So what are, the, what are the effects? And these are all correlational data. The effects are, for prostate cancer, is that there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in men who work in the factories bagging atrazine and breathing it in. That's compared to this low number. Those are men who work in the factory but don't work in the room where they put the atrazine in the bag. And this is from their company in San Gabriel, Louisiana, and a data that are published by the company in a community that's 80% black, African American. And I point that out for reasons that I'll, that I'll get into later. Their lawyer wrote me a letter and they said they were upset that I point that out in my talks. They said, we don't put our company in that community because black people live there. We put our company in that community because it's low income and that's where black people tend to live. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, how is that better than what I said? I, I have this in writing. Where did this guy get his law degree? That I don't know. So there's another study that's shown that, that, that women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't use their well water for drinking. Now, that's just correlation, but the company's done studies, this isn't my work, where they took rats that normally have a breast cancer incidence like this, and they give them atrazine, and imagine that. If you give a rat atrazine, 
they're more likely to get breast cancer. And if you're exposed to atrazine in your drinking water as a human, you're more likely to get breast cancer. Somehow they don't see the cause and effect. In humans, we also, now this is, we've done studies like this, but this is also their studies. If you take human cells and put them in a Petri dish, that cells that don't normally express aromatase or make estrogen, and you give them atrazine, they start expressing aromatase and making estrogen. Same thing we've shown in fish, same thing we've shown in frogs, same thing they've shown in reptiles, same thing they've shown in birds, same thing they've shown in rats. This is human cells. We're animals just like the rest of them. We make and use estrogen just like any other, any other animal. The significance of that is the following. And this is work from my graduate students. Sometimes we do fancy molecular work. If you take a breast cancer cell in culture from a human and give it atrazine, it starts expressing aromatase and making estrogen. That's significant because the ER stands for estrogen receptor. It's because breast cancer is estrogen dependent. And most women get breast cancer after menopause when the estrogen levels are lower than they've ever been in your life. Except that, remember, these cells, when they become cancerous, when they become mutated, they express the aromatase, they make their own estrogen locally, and the estrogen is sort of the key that causes those damaged cells to turn into tumors. So estrogen feeds the breast cancer, if you will. In fact, the aromatase expression, this machinery I talked to you about in frogs, same, exact same enzyme, that enzyme's so important that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole. It's a drug. And it works by decreasing aromatase and decreasing estrogen. So even if you have a damaged or mutated cell in your breast, it won't grow. It's like having a car, but if you don't have the key, it can't go anywhere. That's what letrozole does. It takes away the key so that the cell can't grow and become a tumor. What is that? Does that make any sense? When the number one contaminant of drinking water does exactly the opposite, turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, promotes breast cancer in rats, and is associated with breast cancer in humans. Here's what really got me in trouble, pointing out the following. In the year 2000, this is from their website, the Vars and College offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. Yeah, in case you're not following, the same company that gave us 80 million pounds of atrazine sells the aromatase blocker as well. The same company. So that if you were living in the Midwest or living in an agriculture community taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, that drug sold by Novartis was ba battling it out with another chemical sold by Novartis that does exactly the opposite. I published a paper called The One Stop Shop, Chemical Gun Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. They got upset. The same company, and it's not that uncommon. The same company that made DDT is that same company. The same company now that sells all those cancer drugs is the same company that was selling all those pesticides and other chemicals that are associated with the very diseases that they're quote unquote curing. So I think what's happened is my interest in this aquatic organism, because I really wasn't interested in humans. That's not why I went to college and got my degree. I wanted to study frogs, but it's taught me a lot about this aquatic organism. Because we start out in water, the amniotic fluid, and we start out needing and using the exact same hormones as my frogs. Testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormone, stress hormones called glucocorticoids, exactly the same hormones, synthesize exactly the same way and use exactly the same way in their bodies. But what happens when you throw in chemicals that interfere with those hormones? For atrazine, we know from most of the 80,000 chemicals that we use today, we have no idea. In fact, studies have shown, not mine, that you and your children will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before you leave the womb. Because the placenta was not designed to keep out the 80,000 things that we've invented over the last few decades. We're moving faster than, than physiology and evolution. Here's what we do know about atrazine in humans, so, or in rats, which supposedly tell us something about humans. We know that it causes prostate and mammary cancer. Those are the number one cancers in men and women, depending on the year, right behind lung cancer associated with smoking. That's significant. The number one chemical company in the world at the time was contributing to that, is contributing to that. We know that it causes immune failure in rats. We've shown the same thing in amphibians. We know that it causes neural damage when you're exposed in utero. Other people have shown the same thing in frogs. And these, though, rats are a proxy for us. What I'm going to show you now is, is research 
that changed the way I view my role as a scientist and an academic. And it's not my work. Again, I'm bragging about something somebody else has done. An EPA lab, in fact, the Economic, excuse me, Environmental Protection Agency, has <laughs> shown that if you expose a pregnant, sometimes I get the E confused, you'll see why I say that in a minute. If you expose a pregnant rat to atrazine, it's more likely to have an abortion. She's more likely to have an abortion, a miscarriage, because you upset the hormone balance. EPA labs publish that. Of those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. A second EPA laboratory showed that, not me. The sons are born with the prostate of an old man. Of those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired memory development. That's what that looks like. Such that when those rats grow up, they can't properly feed their offspring. So their offspring experience retarded growth and development. And it's this third study that really impacted me. Because see, that rat on the bottom, the rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So even though I'm, as a scientist and as an academic, when I think about my little girl and my son, when I think about your children, and the fact that your grandchildren, that my grandchildren, your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today, like atrazine. And this is one that we know something about. Most of the 80,000, we know nothing about. This is one that we know about. A colleague of mine has shown, again, this is not my work, that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination exposure, you're more likely to have a child with birth defects. That's just a correlation. It's not an experiment, it's just a correlation. If you get pregnant during peak agricultural runoff of atrazine, you're more likely to have a baby with birth defects. And I'm gonna apologize, here's some of those birth defects. I'm gonna apologize for the images. Here's a paper, this is not my paper. Somebody else published this. But it shows agriculture-related chemical exposure, season of conception, and risk of gastrothesis. And this paper concluded, I'm gonna blow this up, that maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. You guys know what fetal gastrothesis is? I can't even pronounce fetal gastrothesis. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Here's what it is. Close your eyes if you don't want to see the image. And this is, actually, this is a slide from Adrian Bruno Brown, a form, former student in my lab who's now an MD. Gastrothesis is when the baby's born with the intestines outside of its body. And this is associated with overexposure to estrogen. And if you're exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have a baby. There are places in Hawaii where there's three, four women on a block that have this rare condition. There are places in London that are contaminated with atrazine where they have five, six, seven women on a block that are born with this condition. Here's another paper that's not mine. Case control study of maternal residential atrazine exposure in male genital malformations. I'm interested in this one though because, and I'm not gonna read this to you, is what they've shown is that if you're exposed to atrazine when you're pregnant, and again, I apologize for the images, you're more likely to have babies with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. You're more likely to have a baby with cryptorchidism. That's where the testicles are inside and don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a baby with microphallus where the penis doesn't actually grow. And the reason that I find this interesting is because male genital development depends on what hormone? Testosterone. And if you're exposed to a chemical that reduces testosterone in every animal model that's been examined, you have a baby that looks like it didn't have enough testosterone. We also know that estrogen overexposure can cause all of these malformations. And if you're exposed to a chemical that increases estrogen in every animal that's been examined, including human cells, you have a baby, a male baby, that looks like it was exposed to too much estrogen. Now, here's why I call the EPA the Economic Protection Agency, because here's what they said to New, York Mag New Yorker Magazine. They're not denying my data anymore. What they said, though, was, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives, and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. So they're not denying. This is an EPA spokesperson said, and it wasn't like it was said, oops, I didn't know the mic was on. They said this in writing to a magazine where they knew it was going to be published, that a monetary value. So they're, they're saying, yeah, we know this stuff is bad, but this company's making a lot of money on it. So we're gonna keep using it. We accept that there will be disease impairments and shortened lives. 
That's what the U.S. And, and, and that was the Obama EPA. I ain't got nothing else to say. They said that to New Yorker magazine. So here's what we know about our model. It might just be a lowly frog, but it's telling us a lot about other animals, including humans, because we use the same mechanisms and the same hormones. What we're learning though, however, is that there's a lot of variability. And, 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 and I should have called this talk, duh. Because here's what we figured out. There's a spectrum. I have a very, very active, uh, 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 politically active young friend who says, sex is not binary. There's a spectrum. Here's what we know that atrazine does. And what I'm going to show you now, this can all happen in one tank of frogs, exposed in the same tank. You can expose some to atrazine, and their testosterone levels look normal. For a typical male, they have a cloaca, that's the back end, that looks like a male's. They have breeding glands, so they have these testosterone-dependent glands on their arms. They have a larynx that looks male, that's what that looks like, and they have testis with sperm in them. So some frogs, like this one, mating like a male, it's like you didn't even put atrazine in the water. Some of the frogs in the same tank are what I call demasculinized. They have low testosterone, their cloaca still looks like a male, but they have low breeding glands, a larynx that looks like a female's, if you want to know, the muscle goes all the way around in a male, but here it stops at the thiohyral. It's just structure, don't worry about it. They're missing testes, and, and they simply don't breathe. They aren't interested. They're demasculinized. In the same tank, you can have partially feminized individuals that make estrogen. They have a cloaca that looks like a female, no breeding glands. They have some female parts. So these are testes, but this is an oviduct. So that's the equivalent of a man with a uterus. And they breed like, fe they, they mate with other males as if they're females, even though they're genetically male. In the same tank, you can have individuals that make lots of estrogen. They have a cloaca that looks like a female. So this is a structure that's used to lay eggs. And, and they have no breeding glands, a female larynx. They're full of eggs, and they breed like a female. You couldn't tell them from a female. I call this duh, because if I sprayed a poison in this room, not everybody would be affected the same. Some people might die immediately. Some people might get cancer 20 years from now. Some people might get cancer 30 years from now. You're not going to all necessarily show the same effects. I'm really interested in, and one of the things that Ceres Foundation and Beyond Pesticides has helped me support, is studying the variation. Because not only that, not only can you get variation between individuals, you can get variation within an individual. So I already showed you this, right? So this is a genetic male, but not the whole gonad turned into an ovary. Some parts of the gonad were more sensitive to, than others. We're trying to understand why that is. And the last little bit I've shown you, and this is the most exciting work that Beyond Pesticides and Ceres Foundation has funded, is that different families have different susceptibilities. Again, I could call this duh, but we were kind of surprised. So here's, here's how we did this experiment. What you're going to look at, the blue is going to be males, and everybody should be a male. We're only using genetic males. And this is work with estrogen, pure estrogen now, not atrazine. And what we found out, we were trying to figure out like the dose effect, like what's the minimum dose that'll make males grow ovaries with estrogen, not atrazine yet, we'll get to that. And, and, and so we went higher and higher in dose, and as you see now, females start to show up, and, and here's what that looks like under the microscope. These are ovaries, and, and here's what it looks like, these are testes, and if I slice it up, what ovaries typically have a hole in the middle, called an ovarian vesicle, and testes don't have that. So I was like, okay, so this is the level of estrogen where you start to see effects. Is, is, that, is that clear what I'm talking about? But then that pair of animals died. Not to anybody's fault, you know, they, they eventually died. So we started to experiment over again with a, with a different set of animals. And look, we got a completely different result. And then I said, wow, that's, that's crazy, let's, let's do it again. So we got a different pair of animals and, and we got a completely different result again. The ones that are in yellow are hermaphrodites and I can, I can show you the histology if you don't believe me. So that's testis at the bottom and then the top part, that those were all ovaries. And then we did the experiment again with another pair of animals, and they couldn't even tell there was estrogen in the water. And now I'm going to show you what's my favorite slide of all time. It took 10 years to produce these data, twice as many undergraduates, and 1,000 times as many frogs. So these are what this is now. You're going to be excited about this. Trust me. I'm going to show it to you five times. So these are the red or, well, here I'll show you. The, the blue are testes, animals with testes, they're all genetic males. The red now are animals with ovaries, and the yellow are animals that had both testes and ovaries. They should all have testes. And what you're looking at, these are different pairs. So look, you'll see why I love this slide so much in a minute. 
So look at that. I can take this pair of animals and give it estrogen at the same dose as, as, as we give atrazine, and 100% of them turn into females. They grow ovaries. I can take this pair of animals and give it estrogen, and it's like it's not even in the water. It takes 10,000 times more estrogen to make those offspring respond. Here's what's interesting. Everything on the sensitive side are animals that I collected from either Africa or San Diego or San Francisco, and everything on this side are animals that you can buy from the shops. Here's what that means. That means that if you wanted to test your compound, let's say you were a company, I could send you this pair of animals and you go, nope, it's not estrogenic. I could send you this animal and you go, oh yeah, it's pretty estrogenic. What that means is, like when the company said to me, research that we have funded does not support the conclusions that Hayes is drawing from his own research, you, you, could, you could do that if you had this information. You could, you could make my data ir irreproducible just by using the right or the wrong pair of animals. Now, the company lawyer writes me letters and says, well, we could sue you for libel because I'm going around saying they tried to discredit my work. Where would anybody get that idea from? For example, here's what they said in New Yorker Magazine. They said, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. I am troubled <laughs> by the suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. They lost a $105 million lawsuit all of their secret notes became available and public that were filed under seal, including their strategy for how they were going to deal with atrazine. Look what these fools wrote down as their number one goal for science on atrazine, <laughs> discredit Hayes. So somebody sat at a meeting, somebody sat at a meeting and wrote down, this, this is the first thing we need to do. And have you ever watched that show? One of my friends started me watching, what's it called? How to Get Away with Murder? And she makes a list. The first thing she puts on the list is discredit the witness. So clearly she was working for Syngenta at the time. What's more is they made this list, part, but can I say shit? I said it. They made this list of shit that they were going to do to me in the meetings and wrote it down and turned it into a judge. And it includes, the, I'm just going to read this, it includes things like have his work audited by a third party, FOIA, raw data, and get the ask journals to retract, investigate students. They scratched that off. I don't know if that means they did it or they found nothing. Investigate funding. Because they were convinced that I must be telling the truth because somebody else was paying me. I can tell you, beyond pesticides or NRDC or anybody I've been affiliated with, was in no way, in fact, the only person, the only group who's ever paid me specifically to study atrazine was the manufacturer. And I really thank them for turning me on to that. They, they wanted to do an NRDC audit. They wanted to investigate my wife. I don't know what she did. My family background, my school history, consider suing for libel. Because, you know, I say some stuff that's, you know, inflammatory, I guess. Multiple emails, they wanted to convince me, EP, and this is my favorite. Look what somebody, set a trap. <laughs> somebody sat in a meeting with a spokesperson who said, we, we would never discredit anyone. Our goal is to set a trap. <laughs> and then they turned it into a judge. Everybody know the first page of the secret spy evil handbook is, if you do write it down, one, you don't write it down, and if you do, you shred it and eat it and self-destruct it and burn it. You don't turn it into a judge. <laughs> and stamp on there like secret files or something, I don't know. So, so the point is, you can get any answer you want. And the, and, the, and the thing that we're now being funded to do, and I'll get to the end in a second, is to try to understand this variability. Because see, what most scientific labs are trying to do is you want a repeatable answer. That's why you use strains of rats. That's why you use cell lines, but the bottom line is, if you're using a cell line, for example, with the exception of, 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 of HeLa cells, most of these cells, that, that people are using are irrelevant to the people who are more likely to get and die from cancer because they don't come from minorities. So if you're not trying to understand the variability, you're not trying to understand the problem. Because see, this also creates a problem because how can you use Xenopus as a model to predict what's gonna happen to amphibians in the wild if they're exposed to atrazine? When, when for example, this pair of animals can't even predict what's gonna happen to that pair. So how can, she's a great model for predicting effects for humans, but she's not even a great model for herself. The other thing that's exciting that Beyond Pesticides and Series is helping support us do is this guy is pointing at the creek in San Diego where I collected my frogs with Emily 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. And here's why he's pointing at it. So here I am back with my, my son again. He's big now, runs his own lab. Here's what he's pointing at. That's where we get our frogs from. He's telling us that there are also frogs at those sites. And you know what all this is in the middle? It's a golf course. 
which uses, I already said shit once, I'll say it again, shitload of atrazine. But when I collected the frogs, I wasn't studying pesticides. I had no idea. So now we're probably looking at animals that for multiple generations have been exposed to chemicals over and over and over again. So one of the things we're doing is study, studying animals up and above that level of contamination. And, and, and so that's been fun. The other thing that we're doing, and, and this is also supported by Ceres and, and Beyond Pesticides, is I grew up in South Carolina. And I fell in love with frogs in South Carolina. It wasn't a park back then, it was just a swamp in the Congaree National Park. It's now a park. And this paper came out, this news article came out, that it's contaminated with not just atrazine, but ethanyl estradiol, the estrogen from birth control pill. And what I immediately saw, and it's my hometown, gives me enough excuses to go back now, because what I immediately thought about, because the article focused on, it focused on these guys. It reminds me of the talk the panel we just heard. It focused on, what about the recreational canoe and kayaker? What if they fall in the water? And I thought, what about the low-income black community that lives in that area? You're talking about some, some guy who comes in the road to the park. And I thought about, what about the very reason that the park is there to protect the animals? None of that comes up in the article. And then I thought about this. How can we use Xenopus as a lab model to make predictions for 20 species that live in that park that are breeding in the wintertime and the summertime under all kinds of different conditions that we don't test or control for in the laboratory? So we're trying now to develop much more realistic models because even some chemicals that might not do anything alone, when they're mixed with other chemicals and when you change the environmental conditions, how are they impacting those animals? What's more is, what if you live in a community like this? This is Salinas. I don't have to tell this group about Salinas. Normally, when I'm giving a talk outside of the state, I go, who's ever eaten anything from Salinas? Raise your hand. And then I go, everybody raise your hand, because 85% of the country's lettuce comes out of Salinas. So what about the frogs that are living in this water, surrounded by the agriculture? And what about these individuals that are living also surrounded by that agriculture? How do we look at those mixtures of compounds under different environmental conditions and predict what, what their ultimate impacts are? So, I've crossed a line. <laughs> and by that I mean, I'm supposed to walk across it when I say it, is one of the attacks that Syngenta made is they refer to me as an activist. Scientist turned activist. Somehow you can't do both. But what's more is I got that from a lot of my academic colleagues that said, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. And I started to think, how can I not be an advocate. How can I do this thing we do in the ivory tower where I write these fancy papers in a place that nobody has access to? How can I do that when the EPA says things like, and this was to a reporter as well, the ultimate decision about atrazine they were talking is much bigger than science. The EPA said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. How can the public have an opinion if I do what most academics do and don't be an advocate? So now I have a couple different philosophies that I follow. One is, there's a guy who said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be an advocate and a scientist, at least this guy thinks, I have a duty to do both. And finally, another great thinker once said that I think will resonate with this audience, that it's time for us as a people to start making some changes. We heard some examples of what we need to do right here. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. We heard some of that right here. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's on us to do what we gotta do to survive. In case you don't recognize it. This guy had it right over 30 years ago. Thank you.